So welcome to a new conversation of the possible Decalogue for the institution yet to come, a program that emerges from the desire of La Casa Entendida to rethink the role of the institution in this specific moment where everything we know is rapidly changing. To do so, we have borrowed the definition of queerness of Jose Esteban Muñoz to think about the potential of the institution that we will do not know, we still do not know. Through the exploration of the ideas of diverse colleagues, we intend to think about some of the different roles that the art institution serves society. The core of the conversation today will be to think together about the responsibility of the institution specifically towards the artist. The collective of artists has probably been one of the most affected within the art field during this pandemic. Cancellations of shows, delays in the concession of grants, difficulty to access studio spaces, all of them have put a lot of added stress to their production conditions and have yet contributed to the further precarization of their situations. Their position might not have changed dramatically, but the circumstances has precisely made more evidence than ever their vulnerable existence as artists in this economic system. In an open letter published in mid-March uh, by artist Paul Maeke in a French website, he gave account of the many situations in which artists have had to decide to stop making art or have been forced by several circumstances to stop making art. This compelling speculative account points out at the impossibility to earn a living as an artist and somehow demands the engagement of the art world in a different way other than representation. The variety of organizations and the way they support artists' careers is wide and it is important to acknowledge these relationships. Strategies, nevertheless, have had to adapt throughout the hold provoked by the pandemic. Today, I would, uh, I would like to share thoughts, questions, and strategies with two other colleagues, Emily Pethick and Vincent Honoré. Thank you for, invite, for accepting the invitation and being here today with us. To think together how we can serve best the artists from the institutions. How can we think of the institution as a space for artists, uh, really as a space for care, production, accompanying the space for them as a facilitator? So I would like to welcome and thank both Emily and Vincent for being with us today. Emily, uh, Emily Pethick is the director of the Rijks Academy van den Ben Gunsten in Amsterdam since 2018, sorry. Um, the Rijks Academy was established in 1870 as an academy and it was in the 1980s when they shifted to a residency-based project, came through the conversion of the classrooms into artist studios and the transformation of academic curricula into support for the development of artist practice. It is an institution of a long tra uh, tradition and trajectory where a long list of artists have found the space to give certain ground to their emerging practices and also found the space to create a community with peer artists while building an international ne network facilitated by the institution. They were meant to celebrate its 150th anniversary last month, um, but they have postponed all the celebrations to next year. Emily was previously the director of the showroom in London from 2008 to 2018, the director of CASCO, uh, Office for Art, Design and Theory in Utrecht, the Netherlands, from 2005 to 2008, and curator at Cubit London from 2003 to 2004. She has contributed to publications and co-edited numerous books. She was a member of the jury in the to, uh, 2017 Turner Prize, and she has contributed to several panels internationally. Since January 2019, Vincent Honoré is director of exhibitions and programs of Montpellier Contemporain, MOCO, where he has contributed to the thinking of the newly opened institution in the south of France. MOCO is defined as an arts ecosystem that includes two exhibition spaces, centers rather, and an art school. 
l'Hôtel des de Collections, un exhibition center for public and private international collections, la Panacée, Contemporary Art Center and ESPA, the Montpellier Art School. This conjunction gives the organization a unique opportunity to mix uh, training with production and exhibition. Vincent's trajectory in both UK and France has taken him to diverse positions in a variety of arts organizations, such as senior curator at the Hayward Gallery, London, from 2017 to 2018, during which time he was also artistic director of the 13th Baltic Triennial. He was the founding director and chief curator of DRAF, a non-for-profit charity in London, and he has also been part of the curatorial teams of Tate Modern and uh, Palais de Tokyo in Paris. So um, before we get into the conversation, I would like to hand over to Emily to learn about her contribution to this decalogue of what the institution yet to come should be as, a, as a possible. I wish I knew. <laughs> well, thanks very much for inviting me. I don't know how the acoustics are. It's uh, um, still in the home working scenario. Uh, so, well, I have to say that I don't profess to know exactly what the ideal institutional conditions are for artists. I think um, every artist needs something different and that's maybe one of the, yeah, one of the challenges in a way in, in running an institution. Uh, and, you know, it makes it difficult. And I think actually one of the starting points is always about listening uh, and about uh, transparency as a, as a good start. Um, and I think what I can do now is maybe to talk about some observations of things uh, from, well, my previous position at the showroom and my current position at the Rikes Academy. So actually when working at the showroom, we were mainly commissioning artists uh, to make new work. And we were often working with kind of uh, practices that were quite, um, I guess, quite long-term research oriented, collaborative, relational, fairly experimental methodologies. And I think what I noticed there is that often these things take need a lot of time. And so we always ended up giving a lot of time uh, for projects, for artists to, to, to find the potential of what they could reach through a project. So slowness, I would say, is one of the conditions that I feel is, is rewarding. Uh, and also I think to have a, yeah, to have an ongoing conversation and dialogue. Um, I think a lot of artists who worked with us appreciated the engagement of the team, feedback, thoughtfulness, time, care, uh, that led them to feel well supported. And I see that at the Reichs Academy as well, this uh, attention. Uh, and I mean, not, yeah, but uh, uh, the care that goes into um, uh, the engagement. So, yeah, it was a lot to do with listening to being responsive to processes, thinking, uh, thinking with uh, artists, connecting to their practice and also connecting our knowledge and experience of the context. Um, and I think every project was different. So in each time you have to form a, a new relationship. Um, so you can never kind of come in with standardized expectations. And I think that's also, again, the institutional challenge when you're always working with very diverse uh, practices, ideas, people, you know, like is to, to keep a kind of openness and flexibility and responsiveness uh, to treat every case as, as different. Um, I think at the showroom we were more agile as an institution because we were very small and with the Rikes Academy this is you know something that uh, uh, has well over, I think over the years the Rikes Academy has developed uh, a, a kind of um, a, a kind of very impressive knowledge of like how to deal with some of these issues on the bigger scale um, I think at the showroom, it was important to a lot of the artists we worked with that there was a kind of uh, context that they wanted to engage with and plug into, that we weren't a kind of neutral container, but actually as an institution, we had certain values that people could identify with. We were working with, uh, in a way, we were building a lot of communities around our work that made it a place that artists were keen to 
to the artists that we worked with are often keen to connect into and that wasn't just about within the art world but also within our local context uh also in terms of like building communities around particular kind of discourses uh with the theory as much as with um questions of social justice that we were working with um i think really a lot of things boil down to trust actually gaining the gaining trust um and a lot of that has to do with being open honest transparent um yeah and i think a very important issue is uh economy <laughs> you know like even for example at the showroom we were on a very meager economy but we are very open about that and we work together always to try and solve problems and challenges that we were facing but i think you know a bottom line is also about these questions about uh, you know like creating the the conditions that um you know for for uh, um uh that are respectful and um that uh, recognize that uh, you know artists have to be paid <laughs> um i mean at the rex academy we have 46 artists in residence uh it's a much bigger team and i'm sort of further away uh from let's say the daily uh uh day to day i guess uh um working situation and the practices um and there's a lot of diversity within our artist community so in a way it's really at the other end of the spectrum from uh what i was doing at the showroom artists come for two years um and i think the the conditions the i mean we have a huge number of applicants of very few places and i think the things that attract artists are about having time uh space like an individual studio a lot of resources in fact these are all the things that we <laughs> lacked at the showroom resources <laughs> space um and so i can see how um these very in fact basic conditions of having a studio a stipend uh um people you know a community um in this case a very diverse international community um i can see that this is uh great conditions uh, for for artists to really focus on their work a lot of artists haven't had a studio before coming um have been juggling many kind of uh, jobs and uh, in a way i think feel like i often see how um the 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 demand the way the art world demands from artists a lot uh, without giving much a lot of the time creates uh, a kind of pressure cooker that i think a lot of um, artists are kind of um i think it produces a lot of stress and anxiety actually which is not conducive towards uh, creativity um i think with the rags academy there's quite a strong focus on the individual um and i think one of the things i'm grappling with is how do you kind of produce a long term sustainable wider conversation uh where the artists can empower each other and this is quite difficult to achieve when you have such a diverse artistic community who have all you know different interests and issues at stake coming from very different contexts so how do you create an inclusive approach and find the conditions um for this without being top down and i think one of the things that um i always tried to work with is kind of um i guess drawing from practice and not trying to superimpose uh uh institutional uh kind of framings uh, but to try and let things emerge through process and through dialogue and engagement um one of the things we're also working on establishing which we did at the showroom is to to find the way to um make the institution in a way a bit more porous in relation to its local context and find the ways to build productive relationships towards a, a wider social landscape which i think in a way also brings the possibility of um yeah trying to open up the kind of art sphere to other to other dialogues and influences um which are kind of happening quite naturally on their own but i think how do you sort of produce more of a a kind of active approach to that as an institution that then can be very enriching 
to artists when they come. Um, so I think, yeah, the question for me is in the way that the balance between, let's say, individual needs and uh, the need for time and space, I think, uh, and how you produce a, a kind of dyna a dynamic collective uh, conversation at the same time. So um, I think one of the things that I'm heavily aware of is, I mean, as I mentioned, the precarity and the pressure that artists are onto under and the kind of inequality in, in the system, which in a way is not a problem that one institution can solve. So it's something that we have to work together on across the, across the sector to, to kind of make change. But maybe I've said enough things as a starting uh, rambling. <laughs> Let Vincent have a, have a word. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you've said a lot of things. That we I hope we can tackle most of them in regards to what you were saying of the slowness, time, practice versus work, probably, and um, uh, economy, as you mentioned, flexibility, opening up to, to the context. So there are a lot of things um, that we can address later after listening to them soon. So what should be uh, the institution of the future? That's the question, no? It's a very terrible question, especially in this very uncertain time. But uh, I think my answer was uh, that the institution should be a safe space. Uh, in Montpellier, we created this new institution, which is very particular in the sense that we have three entities. The first one is a fine arts school. The second one is a contemporary art center dedicated to productions. And the third one is a museum without a collection in the sense that we create exhibitions borrowing uh, works from existing collections, public and private. By doing so, the aim is to create an ecosystem. We are very keen on this work because the ecosystem is as strong as it is fragile, in a way that we want to um, be able to nurture the entire ch chain of uh, of uh, circulation of an artwork from the very beginning, the creation, when the stu students are nurturing their, uh, their practices to the end, when the works are already collected and preserved. Um, in a sense, I think the institution should be an affect in a sense that it should be uh, ethical, it should be inclusive, and it should be benevolent. It starts with the team, of course, how we can make sure that the team is diverse, that we are not leveling down the individualities in the team, but on the contrary, we are revealing subjectivities. The institution should be subjective in that sense. It should allow all the subjectivities to uh, express themselves at different levels from the team to the, uh, to the artistic practices, we should be able to uh, be absolutely aware of our surrounding, the immediate surrounding first, and then gradually the national surrounding and the international surrounding, by uh, being um, very close to the artist, their material needs, but as well their intellectual needs. Uh, here in Montpellier, what we do is that we accompany all the artists, all the curators are going to the studio visits, to do studio visits. We are, uh, it's very the basic things. We are going to see the exhibitions. We are uh, communicating all the time with our community and as well with the audience, because I do believe that the museum is made by the audience and by the community around the museum and not by the people working in the museum. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a global work in a sense. And more and more, I believe that indeed museums should uh, make an effort to be even more inclusive than they are, and not only in terms of gender, not only in terms of race, but as well in terms of social background, which is something in the art world that we need to address urgently, to be more diverse in terms of social background. Back background, sorry, my English is written now, and as we are trying to do so here by including students to uh, the curatorial team, to follow projects, to form them to the to uh, certain jobs of um, uh, to do with, uh, with the art world. Um, I think as well that the institution to do, to be a safe space should be a process and not a uh, too framed and not too defined. It should be able to adapt itself to the different circumstances. Here, uh, right now, we have a brutal example. When we had to close down the three spaces, the first thing we did was, first of all, to take care of the students because some of them were um, 
you know, in the middle of internships uh, abroad, we had to bring them back to Montpellier. We had to make sure they were all safe. We, were, we had to make all, all, some of them lost all, the, all their income because they were, were working in restaurants or whatever. So we made, we created immediately um, an emergency fund to help them. Then we had to work with the artists, making sure that the, the change of programs would not affect any of our partners, be they artists or writers or uh, speakers, turning what we had planned into other projects, online conference, um, making sure that we would pay uh, the only event that was cancelled was a live event, which we could not uh, do, but we paid, of course, the, uh, the artists making sure that this sort of a domino effect would not affect the artists and the, and the community around us. That was the first thing we had to do. And then the second thing we had to do was to think about the future. And indeed, uh, speaking about the future, thinking as well of the students, who for some of them will not find a job during the summer. And you know, when you're a student, the uh, summer job you usually paid for you uh, the year to come. So we are trying to think of certain uh, possibilities to, to help them. Um, so yes, I think the, the the institution of the future should be a safe space. No, it's a, it's something that I think right now, especially now after this halt, which has been a halt, um, I'm personally also thinking a lot about care, which is something that has been going on for a long time. But now I think it's more evident than ever to create those safe spaces where we feel. Uh, safe and we feel uh, cared for and we care for others no but care sometimes has also that double bind that it's very tiring as well very demanding no and I think that um, working in this sector and probably we all are working here as well partly because of that but um, the human relationship to people and in this case to artists is very demanding it's very satisfying but it's also uh, exactly where your life and your work just meet each other and you don't know when to separate one from the other. No? So I think that your two approaches to the institution to come um, fits uh, several, several of the reflections that have been quite collective during this time, which is the temporality, how we live time, how we embody it. And on the other hand, that is space for safety. No? So, um, listening to you both, um, hearing that this, there's a lot of care already going on now, and I think that as Emily pointed out, uh, we can do a lot in an individual basis of uh, specific institutions, but we need uh, to reach certain, um, De not a decalogue, but certain uh, norms or certain regulations cross sector. And there are different uh, initiatives. There's one in the States, which is called Wage Rights, uh, which is a, an independent platform that definitely try to regulate how institutions, American institutions, I think it's only American, um, from the USA, uh, they, they do remunerate or pay uh, individual solo shows, collective shows, etc. And I think it's quite a, a great approach to, to that. Um, I don't know if we have to reach that point, but what, what opportunities you see in, in, in a moment like this? I mean, the, the sector is, there are different uh, bodies uh, like the CIMAM or other bodies, but how can we all work towards that? Well, I think actually at the moment there's a bit of a wake-up call on lots of levels, you know, with the combination of the corona situation where uh, everyone had to slow down, stay in one place, <laughs> think. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and this, uh, you know, I mean, both of these things reveal things that we always knew, you know, like, uh, so nothing's coming out of the blue and we're suddenly thinking, oh, wow, you know, it's all things we knew. We knew there was precarity. We knew there's this kind of, uh, you know, like the way the art world behaves is kind of unsustainable in terms of the amount of um, 
yeah, like uh, this uh, the sort of um, the you know the amount of kind of travel and juggling of different uh, commitments and uh, this kind of excess. Um, so I think it's a moment where maybe we also don't necessarily know the answers, but the questions are being asked uh, of us in a, you know, in a way that we can actually make change. But one of the things I'm aware of is that you can, or you always have to kind of work on yourself, but you also have to work on the wider picture because, you know, it's, it requires, uh, you know, it's kind of systematic uh, change in the end. I think what the COVID revealed strongly is that very badly paid people are essential. Yeah. The nurses, the um, the man who was selling me my vegetables, uh, the ambulance driver, whatever. Uh, and I think I will hope that there will be a, a shift of paradigms, a shift of thinking. Same with the center versus periphery especially with us working in contemporary art centers where we have London, Paris, New York. I will hope that the um, sort of peripheral, peripheral uh, centers or activities or, or, or spaces will become stronger by taking care a bit more of their immediate surrounding. And then there will be maybe more diversity in the art world. But this is only a hope. Let's see how it will go. Now that most of the art fairs will uh, jeopardized as well, maybe it will help to to have, in a way, a broader sense of what is art by possibly as well uh, revealing some forms that had been possibly maybe underrated. I'm thinking about about poetry, for example, for example, that was very strong during COVID. Like Jason Dutch was a uh, was uh, sending every day uh, a poem. Um, or maybe performative works or something, or, or, or artists who have been underrated or, or a bit excluded from, uh, from, from what I would call the center. Maybe that will enlarge, in a way, our perspective by looking closely to, to what is around us. And, and talking about that center and periphery, you were saying, um, how do you think, because now, obviously, one of the things that, at the beginning, at least, I think it's going to be, or it's been already restricted, is mobility. Something that uh, affects the people working in the institution, but also with whom you work. And both uh, MUKU or any other uh, art institution, or the Reish Academy as well, you both work internationally with international artists, international names. Do you think this is going to, change your strategies or how on how you work differently with the artists in the context or is it going to be like another turnaround to see how to still be combining both of them so how is it going to affect this maybe reduction of of mobility in regards to what you were saying Vincent, of, uh, yeah. of well that's something that uh, since the the beginning of the institution we have been thinking of in the sense that we need to be eco-responsible. So we don't want to import an entire exhibition here. We want to work with local producer. We want to work with, uh, with uh, Kratman uh, in the city. So what we would like to tend to do is not to, not to, be, to still be international and to bring different voices in the institution, right. yet try to produce as much as we can on site. And Emily, in regards to, to the academy, it's true that there is a 50-50. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, at the moment, for example, the, the new artist uh, group arrived in late January. And, you know, within the matter of weeks, we're in a lockdown situation where luckily we could keep the at least the access to the studio so they weren't you know like too isolated but um so in a funny way like i mean those artists are here for two years so they're here uh, so it's, uh in a way the question we've been asking is how do you because the rights Academy also benefited a lot from 
you know, the inputs of international advisors. And uh, so the question in a way is like how, I think there's an opportunity, uh, you know, to, to kind of look more locally. Like I feel like the Rights Academy sometimes overlooked the local uh, because it had this really strong international, has had this very strong international network. So I think it's an opportunity uh, to sort of discover, rediscover your your local context. But at the same time, you don't want to be limited by that. You don't want to be just like uh, becoming provincial or, you know. Uh, so I guess it's the, I mean, it's the question we've been asking ourselves that we don't have an answer to because we don't really know what the shape of things to come is. But um, I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, some of our international advisors have been doing Skype meetings which works to a certain extent with artists that they already have a rapport with, but to start a conversation through online uh, dialogue is difficult, you know, and the the kind of what uh, in-person, you realize how important it is to be in-person. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have an answer to the, the question, um, but I think, I mean, we'd already been similarly asking ourselves the question about the environmental impact of, you know, flying people around. And uh, often, for example, when advisors have come from international, they come and do a number of different things at the same time. So it's not like we're just flying someone over. Um, but it is a real a question that I think is a challenge to everybody in the art world. Like, how do you keep connected and dialogue and um, and and not become too, uh, you know, like isolated? Let's say. Before before you mentioned Emily, uh, your idea of was loneliness, and I think that um, this time at home has also served us to realize or to embody time differently. And I think uh, that it, in a way, it is a time of the artist as well, no? In, in, in the sense of just uh, nurturing differently and having um, another pace in their, in their practice. Uh, something that uh, from the academy you really do serve in the sense that it's a very generous uh, period of time, two years. But if we think about um, the next steps, no, we, we've just stopped a world that it's just crazy, you know, that is jumping from one biennial to another one, from one art fair to the other one. And in a sense, it's very related to precisely to the sustainability of the artist as well. You know? It's an international agenda they have to be um, present in to then be into the market, to be then. Um, how do you think, and I know this is also, again, a speculative question, but um, Vincent, for instance, Vincent, are you thinking of treating differently in terms of having exhibitions like a longer time or working in project, process-based projects differently as to contribute to another pace of what is needed? Because funnily enough as well, I think that... Um, in the system we are working today, artists, they need to have, their practice time is much longer than the production time many times, you know, because I mean, research can be uh, also considered uh, the production time, but it is precisely that practice time, which is not remunerate, remunerated, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, or paid for. So um, I, I am under the impression that right now we are in a moment, and as I said before, uh, each art institution serves differently. But I think we are in a moment where we really have to consider that practice-based time, how we can contribute to that as well, to, to, to the artist time, but in terms of uh, economics. No? And it's not to do with one, one yeah. institution. Policy. It's a very important question, but in a way, it depends on how you work with artists. If I borrow a painting from a, a museum, I will not retribute the artist, for instance. But what we are tending to do here at the, at the Montpellier Contemporain is when we are creating an exhibition with an artist, we are trying to um, give a fee, which is 
never enough because it doesn't retribute very well the artist for the time spent on elaborating a project, but as well accompanying a production. So we are producing the works and not only producing, but as well we are giving um, the the tools, the, 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 the some technicians who can accompany the production to ease and some administrative administrative help as well to ease all the process for the artist. Uh, we are as well trying to have multiple residences, uh, especially for younger artists, where they get some money for their time to uh, conceive the works, but as well uh, some funds to produce the exhibitions. And again, another uh, way to accompany them is to write a text to have a curator and technicians with the artist at each step of the creation. Because that's one thing which is money, of course, but the other thing is as well, the administrative and technical help that you can you can need. Now you were, you were talking about the time and the, 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 this very specific time of the lockdown. I don't think the time uh, slowed down. I think it was a very, very particular time because it was at the same time precipitation and stupor. So it was all these conflicting, these two conflicting moments of precipitation and stupor that happened to us. Uh, and a lot of artists I, I know, uh, I'm opening an exhibition in September, we were uh, in contact with all the artists for the production of the works. Some of them they could not produce because either they were emotionally totally removed or they, they could not access their studio, they could not access any material, or they didn't have any money. Because time is nothing without space as well. Yeah, I agree with, um, in the sense it's been a very frustrating time, I think, uh, in, in my case. I had to understand what was going on. And then Did I was- Did you bring Chardonnay? Huh? <laughs> Did you bring Chardonnay? <laughs> It was the time for Chardonnay. <laughs> for Chardonnay specifically. I will note it down for next lockdown. But I think that uh, it was very frustrating because we were not understanding what was going on. And when you are in this productivity uh, will, it's like you don't know how to be without doing anything else or you feel guilty for not doing it. So I can understand the blockage, because at the beginning, many people were saying, oh, this is the perfect time for artists to create. And it's like, what? It's like the worst, because you you, you want to understand what's going on. And I think- Filmmaker been... Christophe Honoré, I don't know if you both know Christophe Honoré, he's a French filmmaker, wrote a very interesting text about the lock, lockdown and uh, saying he was, he was basically writing, for him, it's not the time for productivity. He didn't enter a kind of uh, uh, a, a time for himself. He was forced into the, into this, and for that, for him, is not a time for productivity as well. We should never forget that we think together. We don't think individually. Even if an artist is in the studio, there's always like a kind of a collective communal thinking, and that was not the time for coll collective thinking. Uh, and I was very surprised to hear people who wanted to do like banana cake or learn a foreign language. It was not a time for productivity. Just enjoy the time, that moment for just face your demons and not do anything else. <laughs> it's already quite a hard task. to. Face. I thought it was a time for new hobbies. <laughs> I found some new hobbies. But I think I noticed with the artists at the Rikes Academy that it was really like... Um, when I spoke to them, that's very hard to concentrate actually and to have mental space. And I think that is one of the conditions. And actually in the end, we, um, we, we decided to uh, um, uh, add extra time onto the end of the residency. So now all of the artists actually have an extra five months um, because we could recognize that this was completely counterproductive, even if they can go to the studios, like there's no, yeah, it sucked so much uh, energy from, uh, on the, from your kind of mental space uh, that it was, I think, really difficult to be productive in this time. Yeah, but I think that um, that's one of the challenges to learn how not to be productive or how to live the non-productive time, right? Which sometimes, turns out to be productive at the end. No? But one of the things that, um, like when someone was pointing out about the collectivity, I think that uh, the spaces 
uh, be it a studio space or be it an exhibition or be it the cafeteria, the museum, um, do still uh, have a very important role as a space of um, encounter and a space of um, maybe production as well. So I think that's also um, how, how do you think that the closure of your spaces also have influenced that or what, what's your vision about that? Because after all, um, be it the community of artists or be it the community of, neighbor, of the neighborhood in Montpellier, um, the institutions are due to people, no? So the closure of these spaces um, and trying to substitute them by the digital, I think we've, we are missing out things there. I think, uh, sorry to say so, but during this lockdown and all the online activities proved how very poorly creative we can be in institutions because we were a lot of institutions were trying to replace the uh, emotional experience of an artwork by something digital. It didn't work at all. There was not, there were nothing new. I think what the, the drama of all us privileged people, because we are privileged people, was the lack of novelty during this lockdown and the lack of experience. And closing down the, the spaces was absolutely violent for us because we were closing down the possibility of an experience. In your case, Emily, you said that um, you still maintain the studios open, but also you had to adapt your programming. And how are you planning to, again, produce those spaces of encounter? Well, it was actually interesting that we um, had to close our canteen, uh, where, which is the sort of place where people come into contact. And we reopened it uh, last week, I think, or the week before, uh, just on a more reduced level. But immediately I see, you see a community. It's something really powerful actually that was missing because actually I was popping in every now and again and you can see on our, you can see who's in the building. We have a kind of uh, 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 a way to kind of look at who's around and the building felt completely empty and I would look on the thing and see, oh, there are 30, artists here working like where you can't see it uh, but when you have lunch together you know uh, or we I mean we had to uh, moderate the amount of togetherness there was in our <laughs> in our lunches <laughs> we even have special uh, picnic tables now with the 1.5 meter distance <laughs> that we made but anyway I think there's a funny thing about yeah that um the importance of community and spaces of exchange that were, yeah, were, were kind of taken out of the equation that you felt this kind of absence uh, that is, I totally agree with Vincent that this, um, you know, like collectivity as a, as a kind of generative, you know, as the generative uh, space in a way that's maybe not often credited, you know, that how ideas are generated between people and often that's not, you know, like it's never, it's never that visible as part of a process, but it's, it's really something very essential. So you, you were, you were talking about this new regulation of the, the new picnic tables with the... <laughs> Then, Sam, uh, you, your institution is even more open to a wider public in that sense, because in the studio spaces, that won't change because they are individual. But um, when are you opening and how are you thinking of that opening no? and how the logics is going to change or not? We opened last week. Are you open? Yeah, we're open now. Right. And uh, it's a feast for us. I hope it's a feast for the, for the, for the audience as well to be able to... Because what we are trying to do uh, with the fine arts school, with the two art centers, uh, apart from creating an ecosystem and a collectivity, we are trying to build a common memory with all these exhibitions. Uh, in a way, all the exhibitions one after the other are to be thought as one global exhibition that we are doing, bringing different art from South America, from Africa, from everywhere in the world as much as we can, and to create as well this common memory and to be able to reopen to the public so that we can build it together is absolutely magical. 
Of course, we had to uh, change uh, our habits and we had to ask the audience as well to, uh, to adapt themselves to the new measures. Uh, luckily, the artworks are not, most of them are not suffering from it. We have three or four pieces which are interactive that cannot be activated. So we had to put together some system uh, so people can in a way project how the art, the art should be activated but uh, for most of the art uh, the audience can experience it uh, can experience them as they should be now the school is is closed and it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's difficult for us because it should be the time of uh, for the students to present their uh, their work at the end of the year we should do exhibitions with them we should do studio visits the, the curators at the, at the Montpellier Contemporain should go and visit the students and discuss and engage with them. That's something we are not doing now. We hope to be able to, be, to do it in September. And uh, we are continue, we, we, we are still in contact with the students and uh, speaking with them as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Great, because I have seen that there are certain colleges uh, here in the UK that they are doing the shows online, digitally, which I think it's a challenge. <laughs> I think it's well, no, no, yeah, exactly. It, Sorry it is to say so, but uh, I, think, uh, I mean, if we as curators, we start to begin to think that the online exhibition exists, it means that we didn't understand about art at all. No, but I guess that it's a way of um, how to approach the end of a year and what you can offer to the students that are going to live. I want to think Ooh. that. I'm but, a, bit, a bit provocative about that. But. I can see it. No, <laughs> but it's, no, it's true. I completely agree. And that's why I think that the, uh, we did have a, already a conversation about the art institution as a space of encounter, not only of people, but with arts. And without that space, I mean, the digital will never uh, substitute that experience. So I think um, we all agree on that. In but, a way, it's, a, it's a, maybe it, it could be the same sort of problematic we have with performance and documentation of performance. When you see a picture of a, a photograph of a performance, it's not the performance; it's something else, something like that. Uh, and but when you see, I, I don't know if I'm very well structured, sorry, but you, when you see a film by Babette Mogold of a Trisha Brown performance, you really have the experience of the performance, yet it is a film. She achieved to translate a medium into something else. And I think that's, that's something we haven't yet achieved to do. Uh, the virtual exhibition, the online showroom, blah, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't exist. But if we, maybe, maybe, there, there will be, maybe someone will be able to, to find the way to translate that medium, the exhibition, into something suitable for an online experience that would work. Uh, I know that uh, Gallery in Paris did a virtual tour of their exhibition, but using 16 millimeters film and, and, uh, and, then, and then creating a movie with that. And it was, there was something quite particular with this very simple methodology to, in terms of translation, maybe because of the memory of the 16 millimeter film and it's sort of a very particular image it creates but that at the moment i haven't really seen anything convincing but okay. i love all the other initiative of online exhibitions and la 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 i know it's recorded i'm glad <laughs> <laughs> no but i think i think i mean it's a whole other debate for another conversation the digital mm -hmm. exhibitions but uh, a lot of people have been um um defending them because it gives access to people that otherwise cannot reach that institution but it's something else completely different i see you want to say something else Fanson. well i was thinking that in a way like um, the art world i don't think has really um like found the way with the digital space i think yeah. we're still very analog uh, although there are lots of interesting practices and things taking place online uh, and maybe this pushes us to to try and figure it out a bit more you know like already I think in this three months uh, um, I've done a lot more had to use the digital space a lot more than I was before and discovered that well for example here we are sitting talking we probably wouldn't be doing this uh, 
<laughs> without you know this situation um so i don't want to be too cynical about it but i also see that there's a lot of unquestioning kind of let's just do everything online um with the student exhibitions you have to remember that this is um uh, you know like a, a a difficult situation for everyone and these students all worked you know towards uh you know they they have been working uh towards an outcome let's say and if they can't have it in a physical space at least to to try and uh, find the way i think it's okay but i think it does it poses challenges to us i think uh and maybe we have to take these positively as uh, like i mean what you were just saying now about so about the more creative let's say approach of using 16 mil or how you document something that yeah maybe there's more creativity that can be generated through this uh, pressure to to find the way um going backwards into our conversation and regaining again um the temporality of the artist and 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 all the um engagement that maybe uh from certain projects, like we said already from Rix Academy of uh, two-year engagement, but then maybe in, in uh, institutions uh, that have a platform, exhibition platform, rather than a, a studio-based um, um, project. Um, there is also <clears throat> a difficulty and a challenge sometimes, which is uh, having to make visible um, that which you are doing in the backstage. And with this, I mean, obviously the academy um, has a certain structure where you do uh, studio visits, but probably they are much more professional. But from the moment that you do, um, you engage with an artist uh, as an institution, respecting a temporality, we have to also um, think about if we have to do those processes visible or not in the sense that it's not the same to be a resident and also the stress that that creates of uh, the studio visits or doing open uh, studios whatsoever but if we wanted to also um, engage differently in in an exhibition uh, project in a long process of a year there is this also this pressure towards the institution of what are you doing? So are you doing less exhibitions? Why are you doing less exhibitions? So how do we negotiate with that which the artist needs, with that which the institution is expected to give to an audience? No? And how do you negotiate with that, with that or how have you negotiated with that in the past from your experiences? I think it's a good question. I mean, I, I came to the Rikes Academy from a curatorial background of work, you know, working in institutions that have uh, public programs. And so I came with a lot of, yeah, questions in my mind because the Rikes Academy is very closed, actually. Like it's uh, uh, the, um, there's only three days a year when it's, fully open, let's say, with these open studios. And the rest of the year, you know, for many years, the, the institutions had quite a, you know, like a, been very res resistant towards opening up. Uh, and there's been a lot of questions from the outside about, you know, like, why is this so closed? You know, there's a big <laughs> gate at the front, you know, it's not welcoming at all. Uh, so I kind of came in with this question about how can we open up the Rikes Academy a bit more without compromising what we offer artists, um, because I can see, especially now I've been, you know, had a, a couple of nearly two years to get to know this and hear artists talking about what they value uh, is actually this like chance to step out uh, and uh, have time to themselves, uh, not to be on display, not to have the pressure to, you know, like uh, be on display to show things. Um, and actually with the, when I described the showroom, you know, the way we did quite long-term commissions, I think with that, I learned that you can find the way in which you find openings within the process, let's say, to share. 
so that you kind of engage your your audience or community around something as it develops and so I'm sort of thinking about how at the Rex Academy can the artists share more within the year so that also when we come to the open studios it's not a kind of spec you know so kind of spectacle orientated um so one of the things we did last year was also talk a lot about um you know how can the open studios also be less trying to be something like a a kind of white cube exhibition and more thinking more kind of yeah consciously about what what it means to exhibit in a studio it's actually a unique uh, well not unique but it's actually a very nice thing you know that you open your studio up and it's part of a uh, an an elongated uh, process where if you come for two years and you're let's say done one year that's a moment when you can share something that's very kind of open ended and doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have reached some kind of end point or conclusion or you know point of result and in, in a way it links to how we worked at the at the showroom was also that not seeing let's say an exhibition as the full stop but actually part of a wider a much wider process quite often we were supporting projects that went on to other places they weren't necessarily finished um so to kind of recognize practice uh you know and the the way in which a practice can build uh uh build a kind of momentum that's generative that's kind of ongoing and not the uh um but at the same time there was resistance for example the artists that didn't like this idea at all and kind of didn't uh, like the idea that something wouldn't be finished or you know So I think the thing about the Rex Academy is I recognize that it's like you have to um respect uh, a lot of different ways of thinking and and doing and give space to that give space to artists to self determine uh you know you can provoke certain things or um put ideas on the table but generally like from my experience there'll always be people who don't agree <laughs> so that you know like it's a <laughs> and there's no yeah it's interesting that as soon as you put a stake of position as an institution you'll get the reaction against it uh so in a way it's about having a dialogue and uh, and being kind of open to all sorts of different positions and practices and uh, yeah ideas and creating a space where those can live uh, thrive alongside each other rather than having to push one dominant form or uh, approach like but to kind of recognize the value that comes with that uh, diversity yeah it is a tricky negotiation and it's true that it puts some pressure as well no it's like when you are doing our research and then you need to present that it's like you put aside your research or your practice just mm-hmm. to concentrate on the other one it's an added stress i can understand that uh van sam do you want to add anything at montpellier contemporain we produce about 8 to 10 exhibitions a year and this is only like the visible part of the iceberg because we have of, sco- of course the school and all the residencies and all the action with certain uh, audiences in hospitals in jails in different places we go and find as well the public and this is not visible for the for most of the of the people i would like it to be a bit more visible on the other hand i would like it to be visible but in a natural way and not to open the kitchen you know like in a restaurant but to 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 make sure that this is known in a way that or understood and it's a very difficult thing to do yeah it's like the eternal debate of the social values as well of the art institution no? and all the parameters we have to tick in the boxes apart from the numbers of people that come through the doors no? and to make valuable the extension and how you negotiate uh, making that public no um i we have to finish our conversation so um i don't want if you want to wrap up with anything i would point out and i i will stick to an idea of a soft institution after what we have 
um, spoken about, the, the slowness, the effects, the safetyness, um, and many other ideas that we, we've gone through. But um, I, yeah, I keep that idea of a soft, comfortable institution that I wish we can all build and work towards. Um, thank you to both of you. If thank you. you want to, to thank you very much. I like the soft institution. We can, uh, I can. <laughs> I'm on board. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot to both of you. And yeah, thank you. It's nice to talk. To you. Yeah. Thank we, you. Should, we should encounter in a physical space next time. I hope so. Yeah. Experience the sites. And welcome to, to this technology, uh, Vincent. You know oh, that. that was great. Yeah, your first Zoom. <laughs> it was Zoom. <laughs> That's not like how you got away with that. <laughs> so, thank you and see you around. Yeah, hopefully thank see you Thank you so around. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.